Hi, and welcome to this exclusive training video brought to you by the Category Management Knowledge Group. We've created this video for you because you're obviously interested in furthering your category management understanding and have enjoyed some of our other materials that CMKG provides. In this video, I'm going to walk you through five things that I wish I had known in my first five years in category management, or what we're calling the category management essentials, survival skills. This series will provide you with some snippets of tr different training that we have available in our many certified training courses and hopefully will get you some new ideas and get you excited about investing in yourself or your team or your organization through purchasing some of CMKG's training in the future. In case you don't know about Category Management Knowledge Group, let me tell you a few things before I get started in the actual training. I'm Sue Nichols on the left. I'm the president and founder of CMKG. I spent 20 years at Procter & Gamble, ultimately managing the Canadian Category Management Team and serving on their Global Category Management Committee. Michelle Patterson is the Director of Training and Development and also started her career with 12 years at P&G, both in Category Management as well as in Sales, Trade Marketing, and 10 years as a Corporate Trainer. The biggest distinction between CMKG and our e-learning competition is that we're category management professionals first and an e-learning company second. We have a huge passion for what we do and feel privileged to work with so many category management professionals. We offer accredited courses and programs that all relate to category management for individuals, teams and organizations with many options and flexibility to create custom blended learning solutions. Our training is applicable to different functions and experience levels in organizations, both in North America and globally. So let's get started in the official part of the training. Here's the five tips that we're going to be reviewing in this session. First of all, knowing your data. Next, sharing category management. Knowing how to sell and present. One specifically on PowerPoint decks. And finally, have a plan and a desired outcome. So let's get started on these. Our first tip is to know your data. We're inundated with new and different data sources, it seems like just about every month. And in order to use data properly, you need to understand it. For example, how is it sourced? What are the strengths and weaknesses of it? And how and when should it be used? When you look at these data sources, what do they all have in common? Scan sales, retail measurement, consumer panel data, and shopper loyalty data. Each of them are collected and measured very differently, but they have one commonality. Can you think of it? They're all reliant on how much the consumer purchases. Ultimately, the consumer drives the data, whether it's scan sales data, market data, or consumer panel data. And at the end of the day, what ends up in their shopping baskets is ultimately what generates the sales for both retailers and suppliers. It's not a difficult concept to understand, but it really helps to explain the importance of focusing on the consumer and shopper, even when using data in category management. Each data source has its own watchouts and strengths, which are important to understand. Let's review a few of them and some of the data sources. Retail POS is the queen of category management data, with powerful, flexible analysis. But it doesn't have competitive markets or channels, and retailers need to segment the data ongoing and maintain that segmentation, which many retailers struggle with. Retail measurement data is also very powerful, with in-depth volumetric and causal analysis and comparative markets and channels for retailers and suppliers to benchmark against but it is sometimes only a sample of stores projected to the total chain and sometimes market doesn't cover a large percentage of the total market, particularly in some categories. Also, the data can be very expensive. Consumer panel data is a great source to get consumer and shopper information from. It includes consumer demographics, consumer purchase behavior, and market research can also be conducted using this data source. You need to ensure that the data is significant based on the raw numbers of buyers. You should focus on trends in the data and compare numbers to draw conclusions. Shipment and warehouse data is another data source that suppliers ship to retailers' warehouses, and the warehouses sent to stores. 
This is a last resort data source for situations where you need to create a total market, but you don't have any other data. You need to keep in mind that cases sold does not equal consumption, because the cases can still be sitting in a warehouse. Dollar sales are hard to quantify from cases sold, because the cost can vary based on the customer ship to point. And if you're shipping product to one warehouse, where it's then shipped to multiple banners, you can't see the allocation across banners. There's much more detail that you should know about your data sources than this, including how each of the data sources is gathered. So know your data, not just how it's collected and the strengths of the weaknesses of the data, but think about how it's accessed. Is there limited access to the data? Is it hard to find? Or is it easily accessible, not just within the category management team, but across the organization? And is it consistently available? Does everyone know where to find it? How difficult is the data mining tool to use? How confident are you with the data that it's correctly pulled out of the tool? And how much usage is there of each data source? Are you even using it? It's incredibly expensive to be purchasing some of these, and sometimes there's great underutilization because there's such limited access to it. Sometimes how you answer these questions can also correlate with how accurately the data is used for you, your team, and your organization. There's nothing worse than presenting wrong data to anyone. It loses credibility, and even worse, it can lead to wrong decisions being made if the errors are not caught. Knowing your data and double-checking it is a core requirement whenever data is being used. This can lead to data hole pickers, for lack of a better term, who find the weaknesses in every data source and have everyone so scared to use the data that they don't, especially if they've lost credibility once. And ultimately, this leaves them with nothing. So make sure you understand the watchouts of the data sources, ensure that you're providing good access to the data for everyone, and start training your organization on understanding the data sources and how they can be maximized. As next steps on knowing your data, first of all, get training on your key data sources. CMKG offers three different courses that relate to data. You can also bridge any knowledge gaps that you have in your data understanding by working with your third-party data supplier or through peers in your organization. You may already have internal training available. Lastly, you should identify any gaps that you may have in your data versus what you're expected to do with it. For example, you can't do promotional effectiveness analysis with monthly data. And you can't do in-depth consumer analysis without consumer panel data or some source of consumer data. Tip number four is to share and train in category management knowledge and strategies across functions within your organization and with your retailers. Don't keep yourself up in that ivory tower, sharing little or no information outside of the category management department. This was a practice that was common in the 1980s, but it truly limits the capabilities of your entire organization. You need to train your sales and marketing teams on category management foundations in order to move the bar forward for your whole organization, including your category management team. Within some supplier organizations, there's a belief that sales and marketing should not be engaged in or understand category management. Category management resources are the only ones who do category management work in this situation, and they usually end up being the data pullers, the PowerPoint makers, and the ones who can talk about and explain data. But little of their time actually is spent analyzing and coming up with compelling insights. In this scenario, sales should be selling and marketing should be marketing. But I'm actually here to dispel this myth. In these cases, these suppliers may also follow a very traditional sales approach. First, you have the brand research and development folks developing new products in their secret laboratories. Then, the marketing department is responsible for doing consumer testing, determining the target consumer and how to reach them, and then the new products are passed on to sales and sales is responsible for spinning a pitch for the new product launch. Then, the new products are presented to the retailer. Suppliers are typically focused first on brand and then on category. The addition of category analysis and planogramming by suppliers is an added value to the retailer and a standard practice in most consumer packaged goods companies. A fact-based approach behind category opportunities from a supplier perspective can make a big difference in the results, particularly if the supplier positions the opportunity from a category opportunity, 
not just a brand-driven opportunity. But having the category management work, work completed at the end of the process means that the category management team is sometimes stuck trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. Marketing creates the new product launch plans including distribution targets in the absence of the category management team. Sales in the category management team will receive the initiative at the same time, with sales being responsible for presenting the new product launch including the backup data that was supplied by the category management analyst to meet the distribution targets. And the category management analyst is responsible for making the new initiatives fit at their retailers based on marketing's distribution targets that, from a category management standpoint, are often impossible to attain and really against category management principles. So this can include forcing new items into the planograms that really don't belong there. I'm intentionally being somewhat negative here to get my point across, which is that at no point does the retailer strategy or the consumer come into play in this process. It's all about getting the distribution targets achieved in as many stores as possible, even if it's not right for the product or right for the retailer and their specific consumer. Retailers will have different strategies when it comes to product assortment. They may be trying to carry the widest assortment available, or conversely, they may want to carry a limited number of items, particularly in formats like hard discount. They may have target market coverage objectives to measure what percentage of the total market sales their items represent. Others may have strategies focused on private label, where they don't want to carry much selection in items or brands that compete directly with their own private label, or they may have a focus on large or club pack sizes. Some retailers may focus on a premium assortment lineup that targets a higher income consumer, while others may focus on less expensive items targeted to low income customers. Another strategy may be to be the first to market on new product launches to increase excitement in the stores. Suppliers need to understand each retailer's unique strategies to make recommendations that consider and align with their overall assortment strategies. A one-size-fits-all templated approach is not going to work. So back to our model. Suppliers present products that aren't aligned to retailer strategies and yes, some retailers will list based purely on negotiating their listing fees, leaving out that target consumer and shopper who has unique needs at each retailer that they shop at. And it leaves retailers making listing decisions that may go against their overall assortment principles, is not focused on their shoppers, and ultimately isn't going to work. The opportunity is to integrate a category management approach in all aspects of the supplier's organization, from product development to marketing to sales, a category approach is considered. Data is purchased proactively up to 18 months before a new product launch happens. This gives suppliers insights into how the new products might fit into the category for each retailer based on their overall assortment strategies. And the data and learnings are integrated into the sales presentations. In this scenario, sales no longer has to rely on relationship selling only and lots of money to get new products listed. A fact-based value-add approach can be invaluable to the retailer and this creates a tailored approach for retailers based on their strategies, ultimately moving to more collaborative selling. Suppliers who are able to adopt this approach become much more strategic with their new product launches through strong category and consumer understanding. Also, suppliers need to ensure that they're communicating with all functions at the retailer who are involved in the category. So share your category management. Train sales and marketing on the category management foundations. CMKG has many courses that many of our clients purchase for their whole organization to give them a solid category management foundation from which they can make more fact-based decisions. Think about having an internal category management team that creates a bridge between sales and marketing and or have some resources sitting in the new product launch teams from the inception and move your whole organization forward in category management, moving everyone to a more strategic level together. Number three tip is know how to sell and present. If you're responsible for making internal or external presentations, you should understand the selling process, even if you're a category management analyst or director. It helps to give your flow to your presentations when you're selling any kind of idea and trying to get buy-in 
regardless of who you're presenting to and if it's internal or external. A simple flow can be applied to many different types of presentations that you make. The first step is a summary of the situation. The summary should consider the customer's current conditions, needs, limitations, and opportunities, which tie in with the overall purpose of the presentation. In this case, the customer is the retailer, and a good summary of the situation requires a strong understanding of the retailer's overall strategy, and short and long-term objectives, and focus areas in their business. A good summary in this situation would be to tie in relevant data through some type of category review. Step 2 is to state the idea. The purpose of this step is to tell your audience what action you're recommending. The idea is best communicated in one or two sentences. The idea should be obvious to the audience before you state it, if you've done a good job in summarizing the situation. Step 3 explains how the idea works. This comprises the main body of the presentation. In this step, you need to connect directly to your purpose and bridge it using relevant points and information. Cover enough points to achieve your purpose and objectives, and no more, and be sure to support your points clearly and concisely. In step 4, you should briefly summarize how the idea meets the needs and opportunities that were presented in the summary of the situation. This is also where you explain the specific benefits of your idea where appropriate. This summary should capture the three or four key points of the presentation. The final step is to suggest easy next steps based on specific actions that may tie in with the objectives of the presentation. This is the ultimate purpose of the presentation, yet it's the most often missed step in the process. Whether it's a sales call or an internal pitch, getting the alignment or confirmation is the ultimate goal. Ask for specific actions, and you'll make it easy for the action to begin. Hopefully, you can see from this simple process that it can be applied to many different types of presentations, not just a traditional selling presentation. It really does work. If you don't know how to sell and present, once again there's many options to you. There's great books available on selling and there's also some great online resources. You may have internal courses on how to sell. CMKG has several courses that relate to selling and presenting, including fact-based selling, a strategic selling course, and a collaborative selling course, which gets you into joint business planning at a higher level between retailers and suppliers. These are also all requirements to get your category management certification so selling really is a need as a category management professional. Here's one of our most popular tips, and that's to stop the PowerPoint deck revolution. This tip relates to the size or the deck of your PowerPoint presentation. If you need to send your presentation to an outside printing agency or get it queued because it's too big to print in the office, or you may burn out your printer, or if your workout for the day is carrying the presentation into your meeting, then you may have gone into PowerPoint Overdrive. And imagine the poor recipients of your presentation. There's some classic signs to know when your audience is not engaged. If your audience seems to be focused on other things in your presentation, or if they all seem exceptionally tired while you're presenting, it could be that they've really lost track of your presentation, or quite frankly, they may be bored. These are all classic signs that the results from a big PowerPoint deck can incur. Too much information and not enough focus. Reflect back to my previous tip about presentation flow and focusing the presentation on your customers' conditions, needs, limitations, and opportunities. If you only present what's relevant to them based on what's important to them, they'll stay engaged. Many good ideas and solutions get lost in poorly built presentations that don't focus on the retailer's priorities or the customer's priorities, but only on the idea. Thanks to Dan, a student of ours, for his great expression. I like the idea about giving the slide legs. Forget about the people who are balancing pencils on their noses and falling asleep in the boardroom from the images I showed you before. What happens to your presentation once you leave? In other words, how do you make each slide compelling? Being confident that once you leave the room, your points will be successfully transmitted to others when you're not there, or if they share it with someone else. 
There's a tendency just to put data on slides and pointing out highlights of the data. A better way to approach it is if you put insights into the slides based on the data and answer the questions that tie in or relate to your overall data. Insights are the synthesis of two or more intelligent conclusions that come from the data. So many times we focus on the data or the collection of facts and try to derive insights but it gets really complicated and results in a really big PowerPoint presentation. If you make big PowerPoint decks Try to stop it. If you put together a great presentation, everyone will know that you did a lot of hard work. You just don't have to show it all. And if you need to show the data, you can append it to the back of the presentation. Once again, CMKG offers training with PowerPoint and presentation skills as well as our fact-based selling. Make sure you use insights instead of only data to give it true legs. And use only what's relevant for your business issue in your presentation. So here's our final tip. Have a plan and desired outcomes. We've all been assigned projects in our professional careers, and some of us more than others. I won't tell you how long I've been getting them assigned to me. Whether they're project requests from our manager, a peer, or a client, and through a meeting, a phone call, or an email. Once you've been assigned the project, of course you're anxious to do a great job, and you dive in head first to get it done and meet your deadlines. So you work and work and work. And this may be what happens. By the way, if you've seen any of my training before, this is one of my favorite depictions, and I do use it frequently. So what went wrong? How did you create something completely different than what your customer or project leader articulated? You may not have taken some pre-planning steps prior to jumping in to get the project done or whomever assigned the project to you didn't understand the project correctly either. I'm going to walk you through a great process to successfully complete your analysis projects and avoid these situations. First, you need to define the business opportunity or issue. This includes defining the customer, the decisions that will be made based on the analysis, the objectives and key questions to be addressed, and what success will look like. You should review this with your customer to make sure that you're clear on the overall expectations and outputs from the project. As a supplier, if it's a retailer request, you should share the plan with them and clarify expectations. Next, you need to create a plan instead of determining the plan as you go along. This includes defining the data and tools required, any additional or missing data that's required, who else needs to be involved, the decision makers, and a critical path with all of the key steps as well as a target deadline date. The third step is to organize and assemble the data. This step can take much longer than expected, particularly if you're sourcing data from different places. Next, the fun stuff, or analyzing the data. Look for trends, opportunities, and weaknesses. Don't exclude unusual findings and definitely do not avoid or hide bad news or important findings that may be concerning. Remember, negatives can be turned into the biggest opportunities. You have to summarize your key findings at this point and make sure that they tie back to your opportunity or business issue from step one. From this, use your analysis results, experience, and judgment to define the business actions that are called for based on the results. Provide your recommendations once again, they have to tie in with step number one. And finally, review the analysis and action steps with the decision makers and then present to the customer if they're not the same person or persons. I've also added in an eighth step, which is done after the analysis project is completed. You should summarize the project, including results and follow-up. This is really important so that the history is captured for future projects and opportunities. One of the biggest issues that we have, not just in category management, but within organizations is capturing that history so we don't go and do the same project again right from scratch. It could also include a post-evaluation of the analysis project after the changes have been implemented, actually measuring the results, something else that we're not very good at doing. This process flows really nicely with the flow of the sales presentation that I presented to you earlier. You can easily take the learnings from your analysis project in here and put them into a flowing presentation for your decision makers or customers. So next time you get a big project, 
Use the analysis process before starting any big projects and don't be bullied or panic and jump in head first. You're going to waste time in the long run. We have a course on understanding and using data that walks through the analysis process in much more detail. So these are the five tips that I walked you through in this exclusive video on Category Management Essentials Survival Skills. I created it just for people like you. I hope that you learned a few things, got a few good ideas, and enjoyed the insights that I shared with you today. All of the examples I shared with you come from our set of accredited courses, once again all available online. Regardless of if you're looking for industry certification category management, or if you just want to take some great training, our accreditation confirms that our training meets or exceeds industry standards. You can choose to take one course as a quick fix need for a project or you can select a group of courses that you want to complete in a period of time. Or you can take one of our many programs. Here's the many different options that we have available for our programs. We've combined courses to create different course groupings based on role and what it is that you're trying to accomplish. Most of you are in a category management role, so the category management programs, the gap requirement programs, the build your own program, and the site license approach are all different options available for you. The Site License Program includes all of the courses that we have within our repertoire. We can also customize programs for our corporate clients to include blended learning and customized elements in the program, even live training. If you're interested in learning more about CMKG courses and programs, here are some suggested next steps for you. Also, you'll receive an email from us after downloading this video that will give you more information as well. Once again, I hope you enjoyed this video and I encourage you to continue to venture down your path of continuous learning in category management. Have a great day.